So on 30th of October, I was invited by the organization Stars from All Nations. And this was to commemorate their annual Global Student Entrepreneurship Week. My session was titled how to fix pharmaceutical manufacturing in Africa. And because of the time constraints in that conference, I decided to do this video to share with you some of the key points that I shared with the audience in that event. Stay tuned. Most of Sub-Saharan Africa, pharmaceutical imports constitute between 70 to 90 percent of all medications that are consumed on the continent. And this is quite alarming. Due to this over-reliance on imports, most of the citizens are found vulnerable due to shortages of medication. And this is evident even during this time of COVID-19, where no African country is actually producing the vaccines. Three key problems arise due to the paucity of pharmaceutical manufacturing on the continent. Number one, of course, is access to medication. As I mentioned earlier, the over-reliance on imported medication means that whenever there are shortages from these suppliers, invariably citizens are found wanting. So we have people with diabetes, HIV, and other long-term diseases who don't have access to medication. Number two is the over-reliance on importation. In Sub-Saharan Africa, between 70 to 90 percent of all drugs consumed. This is quite alarming. Imagine a population of 1.3 billion solely relying on importation of drugs in order for them to treat the vulnerable, the sick, the invalid in society. The manufacturing of pharmaceutical products and medicines feeds into the overarching health systems that we have on the continent. Due to the fact that most medications cannot be manufactured on the continent, there is little investment in R&D to foster innovations and breakthroughs to treat specific ailments that are peculiar to the citizens in order to address this failing health systems across the continent we definitely need to plug in this issue of the non-existent pharmaceutical manufacturing on the continent it is noteworthy that in africa we have approximately 375 drug manufacturers for a population of about 1.3 billion that is woefully inadequate and obviously it's a crisis that is sitting on a time bomb to explode. By comparison, China and India have approximately 5,000 to 10,000 drug manufacturing companies for a population of approximately 1.4 billion. This sharp contrast with what we have on the continent obviously means that we are in a crisis and we need to have a conversation around drug and pharmaceutical manufacturing on the continent. Because of my extensive experience in supply chain management, I would proffer some solutions with the perspective of a supply chain manager. My experience covers multiple countries. And as a result, I would want to look at an end-to-end -end supply chain approach to addressing the pharmaceutical manufacturing problem that we have. Having the youngest population on the planet will not even save us. So in this diagram, you see that my approach to addressing the manufacturing issue actually extends beyond just manufacturing. So you would see that the manufacturing is just a component of the entire end-to-end -end supply chain. The first part I want to talk about is really the consumer. No activity in the supply chain can happen if the demand is not triggered you know, from the market or from the consumer point of view. So the activity of a supply chain is always dependent on the nature 
of the demand. So this is a complete, simple picture. So from the consumer, of course, we have the, the pharmacy, okay, we have wholesalers. And whenever a product is manufactured, the point of production is not the final destination of the product. So my approach to this conversation around pharmaceutical manufacturing is that we need to also look or address the transportation gap that we have. What are, for example, the road networks that we have? Do we have adequate trucks? Do we have refrigerated trucks? Do we have reefer containers and so forth? I'll delve a bit more deeper into the details when I proffer the solution, of course. And then there is the manufacturing component of the topic which we are talking about. And by manufacturing, we need to understand that because pharmaceutical production is highly regulated, we need to ensure that the manufacturing topic is centered around investment, is centered around expertise. Do we have the needed technical expertise? Do we have the R&D to ensure that innovation is con constant? And also, obviously, we need to adapt or move our manufacturing to globally accepted standards like the GMP manufacturing and ISO certifications and so forth. Now, one aspect of the supply chain of pharmaceutical products that we normally do not talk about is the suppliers. So what are the raw materials that goes into manufacturing? The conversation over the decade on the manufacturing of pharmaceutical products on the continent has always centered around manufacturing. And we forget that all manufacturing is dependent on raw material supplies. So what are the, are the active pharma ingredients, the, the, the APIs that are needed? Do we have the, the patent on some of the processes? Do we have raw materials for, for iodine, for packaging and so forth that can feed into the manufacturing? These are conversations. These are um, issues that we need to take into account when we want to talk about manufacturing of pharmaceutical products. And of course, there's storage. Pharmaceutical products and medicines have specific storage conditions that needs to be complied with. So we have things like temperature. We, we, we need to ensure that products are stored within specific temperature range to ensure the, the validity and the viability and the efficacy of those medicinal products. Every pharmaceutical supply chain is highly regulated. The nature of the pharmaceutical industry is such that people's health and people's lives are in question here. So the regulation obviously helps to protect the consumer. Regulatory framework has to be innovative enough to ensure that the regulations change with time, with urgency, with population density, and so forth. The regulatory framework is one of the most important topics that we need to address on the continent. The supply chain of all the pharmaceutical products is absolutely crucial for us to understand. So it's not just about manufacturing, although manufacturing is what has been the conversation and the topic being discussed most of the times. We need to have a supply chain approach. So not just manufacturing, but we need to consider things like warehousing, uh, like storage, transportation, retailing. What are the raw material supplies? Where are we getting the raw materials that feed into the production? We need to consider the wholesalers aspect of the whole supply chain. Are they storing the products you know, on time? Are they uh, managing the, the demand and then the supply and so forth? And of course, the retail pharmacies. In most African countries, you would realize that you visit a pharmacy and the drugs are not you know, properly stored in the temperature regulated standards that uh, is prescribed by the manufacturer. And of course, we need to look at the demand aspect of the entire supply chain. And by the demand aspect, what I mean is the final consumer. I would prefer these eight considerations that of course it needs to be made in order to address the overarching issue of pharmaceutical manufacturing on the continent. Number one, demand or the market dynamics. 
one of the key points that we need to understand in spite of the fact that africa is made up of approximately 1.3 billion the segmentation and fragmentation of the market affects planning and investment decisions the market on the continent is so fragmented that it does not give enough confidence to investors to actually put in their monies in order to set up for example a manufacturing plant or invest in distributors this weak fragmentation means that there isn't enough integrated data that can be assessed to make decisions not just on investment but even on what kind of ailments or diseases that requires the priority of the government and the health systems there's also the aspect when we talk about the market and demand that there's a general erroneous notion by some citizens on the continent or some people on the continent who do not have confidence in the drugs that are manufactured on the continent so we have people who would consciously demand for medications that are not produced by the very few manufacturers who are striving to survive number two obviously investments as i mentioned earlier there is the lack of data and business intelligence as far as these different markets in africa are concerned again the fragmentation means that there are different governing regimes and regulatory regimes and for any investor to put in their money in any market they need to be certain that there's going to be some form of return on investment let's not forget that although pharmaceutical production you know is for the greater good all forms of investment would demand some form of return on investment this is why i strongly believe in the power and potential of the the africa continental free trade agreement and this will ensure a more integrated market that will give some form of confidence to investors one other aspect of investment that deters potential investors is the tax regimes so it is crucial you know, as a second point that we empower the local entrepreneurs local business people who want to venture into pharmaceutical production or medicinal uh, production we need to give some form of tax holidays to give them some form of support and by we i mean the governments in these african countries we need to empower the entrepreneurs who are part of their society and are interested in putting their hard earned money into pharmaceutical production number three is manufacturing i mentioned earlier that for any viable pharmaceutical manufacturing to take place first there has to be investment so we talked about investment that the manufacturing itself requires human capital it requires expertise requires people with the know-how it also requires some form of standardization in order to increase the confidence of the consumers so here i'm looking at gmp certifications and iso certifications and so forth the pharmaceutical manufacturing plan for africa that was ratified by the african union is, is one powerful business proposal that we need to go by one of the key aspects that for me draws my attention is the fact that in the pharmaceutical manufacturing plan for africa there is the championing of sourcing local raw materials for the production of these medicines once we do that we empower local suppliers and we empower the local manufacturers we need to have mechanisms to encourage leading global generic pharmaceutical manufacturers to build plants in africa point number four expertise as i alluded to in point number three pharmaceutical production requires lots of expertise here we are looking at how do we foster an ecosystem of pharmaceutical experts researchers production engineers and so forth how do we build a more concurrent engineering model to ensure that 
the R&D across all these functions are well streamlined to give the needed output. More young people need to be encouraged right from the onset when we start either senior high school or the university. Without expertise, there is no coherent output. Number five, raw material supply. From a supply chain point of view, manufacturing cannot happen without adequate, reliable, affordable source of raw materials. So here we are looking at either packaging materials, we are looking at APIs, we are looking at all the necessary inputs to ensure that manufacturing happens. Again, if we have very good procurement practices and we source the raw materials locally, then we can enjoy from economies of scale, which obviously would affect positively the final cost of the medication. Point number six, logistics and transport. Whenever a production happens, we need to move the production output from that point of production to the point of consumption. How do we ensure that medicines that are manufactured get to the pharmacies, the wholesalers, the retailers, and obviously to the final consumer? Due to the poor road networks in the continent, we have had several instances where we are unable to reach certain parts of the rural communities. The issue about access to medication is greatly ameliorated by the improving the transport and logistics and we say in supply chain management that the logistics is the movement aspect of your supply chain in other words your ability to move a product from point a to point b from a manufacturing plant to a distributor or from your primary distributor to your secondary distributor and then to the pharmacies or to the retailers this is absolutely crucial to drive the issue of access and cost of medication to the rural poor. I'm absolutely fascinated by the wonderful work done by companies like M Pharma, companies like Zipline, who ensure that the existing pharmaceutical supply chain, albeit not perfect, they ensure that the ordinary person gets access to medications for their treatment. Number seven is R&D and innovation. So research and development obviously is what drives innovation. There are pharmaceutical companies in Europe, in the, in the US who spend between 20 to $40 billion annually on research and innovation. Any society that does not value its research, that does not value the drive or investment towards research is earmarked to fail. And within the pharmaceutical industry, it is R&D that drives all the breakthroughs that we have seen recently. We cannot drive R&D without investment. It takes either private entities or governmental support to ensure that the needed investment goes into research and development of new APIs, you know, of new therapeutics and so forth. Point number eight is a stable regulatory framework. I mentioned earlier that the entire pharmaceutical supply chain functions within a regulatory framework. There have been instances where companies are shipping products to an African country and because they are using sea freight, it takes like three months, for example. And by the time the vessel gets to the shores of this African country, the government would have changed their regulation, distorting the entire supply chain. So the regulatory framework actually underscores the points that I've mentioned earlier. It has to be firm, it has to be innovative, it also has to give some form of credence to crisis and emergencies where needed. And the regulatory framework cannot be determined by an entrepreneur or by an innovator. Regulatory framework or the regulatory environment is the sole preserve of the leadership, the governments of the African continent. We need to all support the work of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. There's lots of potential if we innovate within the regulatory space.
Having discussed some of the potential solutions to this deficit of pharmaceutical production in Africa, here are some of the intended outcomes if we follow through. Number one is increased access to medication. We have a lot of people in rural communities in Africa and even those in the larger cities who do not have access to medication for their conditions. Number two is affordability. I did speak about the fact that if raw materials are locally sourced and volumes of production are increased, then obviously there's going to be um, some impact on the final cost to the consumer. Drugs and medications would be more affordable if we adopt this locally sourced approach for the raw materials for the manufacturing of these medications. Medication and pharmaceutical products will be more affordable if we focus on building this end-to-end -end solution to the manufacturing problem in Africa. Number three is the reduction of parallel imports and counterfeit drugs on the continent. This is really crucial that we save lives by safeguarding the veracity of medication that are imported into the market. Because of the lack of manufacturing capabilities within the continent, obviously miscreants are taking advantage of that to get in parallel imports and some counterfeit uh, drugs that are detrimental and inimical to the well-being of the people of Africa. And here I'd like to mention organizations like M Pharma and M Pedigree who are doing extraordinary jobs to safeguard the safety of consumers. We would be able to safeguard the public health system if we focus on manufacturing drugs and pharmaceutical products on the continent. Not just the drugs itself, but even consumables that you know are used within the medical field. The social security and insurance systems are hinged on a very robust manufacturing industry for the pharmaceutical products as well as these consumables. If we are able to obviously augment production output on the continent, then we would be able to fill in some of the gaps that currently exist in the public health sector. The building of local capacity. Almost all APIs that are used in pharmaceutical products, especially in Africa, are imported. Now, what this means is that if we are able to empower local manufacturing, what we call the LPPs, the local pharmaceutical production, what is going to happen is that the local ecosystem would be more cohesive. Empowering local production of pharmaceutical products obviously would create more jobs. What that means is that there are other auxiliary jobs, functions and professions that go with the local empowerment of production. So there will be a regular pipeline of students, professionals and researchers into the industry if the LPPs are empowered and are capacitated to produce within the continent. I am certain that this episode of PKB Inspire was informative and educative. It is important that we come together as a people to address this all-important issue of pharmaceutical production on the continent. This will feed into the total healthcare system of a growing population of a continent with so much potential. Thank you for staying with me. Do remember to like, to comment, and to share this video. Thank you, and I'll see you in the next episode.